All right, high rollers, what a pleasure this is. I was on the edge of my seat watching that Players' Championship final on the weekend. The quality of play was simply outstanding, especially in the big moments, and that final was an absolute thriller. Our guest tonight stole the show. A two-time major winner now, the fifth-ranked player in the world, and fresh off his dramatic victory over Michael Van Gerwen. He's with us right now from Northern Ireland. They call him Super Chin, Daryl Gurney. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for being our high roller today. Oh, no, not a problem. Anytime. Uh, pleasure to be on your show. First of all, congrats, man. Well done. It really was quite a display of guts and tenacity. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, obviously, I've played Michael so many times, and they actually, it's been years now since I beat him on the big stage. He keeps on coming up with uh, just unbelievable darts. The last time I played him, I think I was 4 1 down to him or 5 1 down to him, uh, averaging 117. So <laughs> there's just some, there's just sometimes you just need four darts to beat him. But thankfully, it was my turn to win on at the weekend in the, in the Players' Championship. I want to talk about the final and the Players' Championship in a second, but before we do that, you squared off with Brendan Dolan in the last 16. I get the sense that you guys are pretty good mates. What is it like playing a friend in a competitive situation like that? You both want to win, right? It's high stakes. But afterwards, I mean, you guys were smiling, hugging. You guys even belly bumped at the end. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, if we go up there and we play well, I mean, the result kind of comes second because you can always say that, no, we had a great game. Brendan was better than me or I was vice versa. But it was just, uh, I knew over the longer format, I knew that it's more my territory. I can play uh, Brendan out for longer. I can average over 100 for a lot longer than Brendan. So whenever Brendan took a, an early lead on me, but then I, obviously I brought it back to 6-4 uh, up at the break. What really hurt him was, I think I was, I remember looking at the scoreboard and I was on 290 and Brendan was on 112 and I had a 180 and finished 110 and that was to get another break up on him and he goes 6-4 on the break. So uh, straight away then he's thinking he's, he's coming out, he's, he's a break down and he's two legs down uh, and then I've held to go 7-4 seven, seven, up and then he's trying to chasing the games in because, because obviously I'm playing very well myself so it makes the, the task even harder. But yeah, no, we're good friends, as you say. We've played in the World Cup now, I think it's three or four years. And I know Brendan from years and years ago. I remember whenever Brendan was probably winning PDC tournaments and I was still back home playing just local tournaments and we were playing pairs together. So uh, no, I, I mean, I know Brendan now probably about 15 years or more. You mentioned the 180 and then the 110 outshot. There were multiple times in the tournament you did that six perfect darts to close out a leg and uh, at big moments too. Yeah, I think I'd on very crucial times, three times in the final against Michael. Obviously, I think there was a, a 180 and a 64, a 180 and an 84, and 180 and maybe again on another 64. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I just didn't give up and I didn't really look what score I was on. I knew that if I had a 180, they would kind of give me a shot at something. And that was the plan. Don't give up. Don't uh, think that the leg's gone because, as you say, if you can do a perfect six starts from 250 onwards, downwards, you've always given yourself a good opportunity to finish off a leg and steal a leg. And that's what I kept on doing. Yeah, and you mentioned it against Brendan. It's got to be devastating to an opponent when that happens because you think you're going to win the leg and all of a sudden, six starts later, it's over. Mentioned uh, the history maker. you got to love him. He played so well in Minehead. Seems his game is back on the rise lately. Uh, what is your take on the state of the game on the Emerald Isle? I mean, you've got yourself, Dolan, Mickey Mansell, Kevin Burness for the Republic. I mean, you got Lennon, O'Connor, Jason Collins put in some fine performances, Mick McGowan. Where is the Irish game right now? Pretty good, right? It's always been pretty good, to be honest. When I, I was always playing here and I always went to England, and we always kind of got beat at the, the crucial stages. Maybe they qualified for a televised tournament, or if it was 5 all, we must maybe a dart or two doubles. And whereas we're... Uh, and great games and we're winning tournaments over here but whenever it comes to doing 110 average and you've got one dart out of the double they won the match we were sometimes missing that opportunity so I think through with the years now obviously Brendan or people before Brendan they got us on the, the map uh, Brendan put us on the map because Brendan's got their final of uh, a, a major obviously the the World Grand Prix and he done a nine darter there and then I think Brendan's also won 10 players championships so that was always a stepping stone, and then whenever, obviously, I had the opportunity to do it, I realized if Brendan can do it, I could do it, and I think with the, the, the latest 
players that's came through, even ones there's probably there before me now, Willie O'Connor. I think they've realised that what I've done and what Ben has done, it's actually given them maybe a bit more confidence in themselves to go on and do it. And they can do it because obviously they're as good as us. So, um, yeah, I, I just think it comes down to that last 5% of belief. But uh, we've always, the Irish, uh, the Irish have always had the, the standard of any other continent. They go up there and uh, win and win trophies and win tournaments. Okay, I want to talk about the Players' Championship now. I mentioned Brendan. In that match, he started quicker, and then you seemed to get in a zone, and you steamrolled from there. You carried that over to Chris Doby and Danny Knoppert. I said in one of my reports that uh, when you get in that mood, and I've seen it before at the Grand Prix, you're tough to beat. Yeah, no, I, I just sometimes the focus has left me, and I've, I've possibly been in the zone, and for some strange reason, I've maybe went up one leg, been in control, and maybe my three clear darts at an easy double, like my favourite double, double 16, and players went out, and then they've actually won that leg where they shouldn't have, and then they've hammered me in the next leg, and it's affected me then for another two legs, and then it's hard to get the concentration back, because the other person's on such a roll, then that you're fighting a person that's you got out of your zone and they're in the zone and then they're on a roll and they think then they can't be beaten. That's whenever a player is even harder to beat. But no, I was just grateful to get the, get that concentration, that focus back uh, the whole way through this uh, weekend. Even whenever I was taking out big finishes, there was no cheer and it was or less. That's only a, a leg. Try and win the next, next leg now. Yeah, I was in good darts and hopefully get the, the finish line and keep on top of the opponent. Yeah, when Rob Cross won the World Championship, I heard an interview with him where he called it going into his bubble. I'm sure it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, you must step up to that hockey expecting to hit absolutely everything. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, Rob's, uh, Rob's that good a player. Even if I was in my zone or in my bubble, I still couldn't have done uh, what Rob done with uh, them finishes. Them, he kept on taking out. 150s, 140s, 130s on the bullseyes. He, he was just phenomenal last year with his, his finishing. Best I've ever seen a player probably over a full duration of a year just completely wiping the board with everybody and just every leg on it and finishing very well. Can you walk us through uh, the matches in terms of your comfort level, the Dolan, the Doby, and then the Noppert match? Were they all pretty comfortable for you or was one more difficult? On the final day, of my first game, your first game is always you're always nervous because you're starting off from the the start again. But um, I found my feet very well. I think I averaged 103 against Chris and and that 10 three win. I was, I was just a bit more comfortable against uh, Danny. I, I, I watched his game against Steve and I seen that Steve averaged 100 and he averaged 94. So Steve outscored him, but Steve missed doubles obviously. So I thought to myself, if I do the same and don't miss my doubles, I can get through to the final. And that was my plan, and uh, I didn't give him much breathing room. He missed the odd opportunity. He probably missed three or four legs where he could have won. And every time he missed it, I uh, I went in there, stepped up and took it out. And that's probably what got me through to the final, better than just Steve Bunton missing the, the doubles in the quarters against him. Okay, the final, man. What can I say? It was brilliant. At the midway point, it was five each. All holds of throw. Both of you were on fire. I'm just wondering, when you win the bullseye backstage to throw first, do you tell yourself, I'm just going to hold my throw all the way through? Or is that something that seems a bit unrealistic against a Michael Van Gerwen? Uh, to be honest, years ago, whenever uh, Robert Thornton beat uh, Michael in the Grand Prix final, everybody says, oh, how do you think the final's going to gonna go? And I said, oh, honestly, for Robert, they won uh, the final, he needs to win the bullseye. That's how crucial it's going to be. And uh, it, proved, it proved right because uh, they ended up, I think Michael broke him the first set. Robert broke him back. And then the whole way in, there wasn't another break of throw of a set. And Robert won the championship. So I thought the same thing. Because um, if uh, Michael gets two or three legs in front of you, um, to be honest, it's going to be virtually impossible to catch him again because the pressure's off him completely. And he just starts firing and unbelievable darts that you won't you won't even you won't even believe sometimes so I thought to myself if I won the bowl especially over that format if I won the bowl and I've always kept my nose in front and keeping within one leg even if he does break me I can always break him back and then put the pressure on him so from right from the outset from the bullseye I was thinking won the bullseye and get the first leg on the board and always try and stay one uh, one leg in front of him you were deadly on the finishing. You did it time and again. You showed us the recipe to beat the world number one. Just keep the pressure on. And when you get that one dart a double, take your chances. That 64 you mentioned, that was so vital, man. What a shot that was. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was the ghost under the break, 3-2 up. 
I think Michael was in front of me. Obviously, I had the one to leave the 64. Uh, and whenever I, I came back after the break, you know, I was just thinking, well, he's got to fight back. Obviously, he's the, the best player in the world, world number one. He's never going to give up until actually the last start goes on the board. So I thought to myself, whatever he does, I won't give up. So, uh, and then obviously we came back in, got the, the 10th leg, the second break, and it was 5 all. And I thought to myself, if I get up my average for a bit more and take a, a big finish, I'm actually, I can go two in front and then just hold. It would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> but then, <laughs> he, but I, I kept on missing the opportunity and he kept on, uh, he kept on keeping the pressure up. And eventually he broke me, I think, and we went into the, the next break. I think it was 8 7 down, possibly. So I thought to myself, I have to break him straight away because, as I say, if he went two legs in front, uh, I think I would find it very difficult at that stage to come back first, especially when it was first day 11 legs. All right, uh, 10-9, you get a chance, you step back, you collect your thoughts, and then you hit what you called the scariest bullseye of your life. Now, I'm sure you probably hit a million bullseyes, but what were you thinking at that moment? And walk us through that shot, man. Clutch! Yeah, it was unbelievable because the first thing that came into my head was I was on 1-3-2 twice through the match, and twice I threw the darts smooth. And I thought, oh, that that it's going to be in, and I missed it twice, and it was red on the air. So I just thought to myself, just do it again, and hopefully this time it could go in. And it was the scariest ball I've ever had in my life. But yes, I just thought to myself, first of all, give yourself a shot at the ball, don't miss a big number. And whenever it left my hand, and that that dart went so true and straight. It actually, I thought I busted the ball. I threw it that hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, and it was straight, and it was for the win. What a shot that was. Uh, MDA uh, Promotions did a poll on which one of your majors is the best. Of course, this is your second. You won the Grand Prix last year. Uh, most players, uh, most people that responded to that poll say it's this one. How about you? I, I guess they're both special, right? Yeah, both of them special. I mean, obviously, any player who wins any tournament, they always say the first one. I mean, it's hard to beat the first one, but I think this weekend uh, we stood in not double and double out is probably probably the biggest because obviously I beat the the players a beat that like you can't get an advantage off. Uh, somebody misses three darts to get in, legs in the Grand Prix. Whereas I think I won the Grand Prix on how well I started every game. And whereas this year, everybody's getting a fair shot. You're not getting a one or two dart head start. So I think it was all going blazing. No waiting around. Nobody missing doubles to start off with. And then obviously, uh, to cap it off and beating uh, the world number one in the final. Great to see the reactions of your father, too, from the nervousness before you made the shot to the excitement after you won. He must be loving this. Somebody was texting me today, and I'm still in shock, to be honest. And they've actually... I still I watch keep on watching that bullseye going on and I still I keep on saying I don't know how you had it but I had it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's just one of them ones. I was playing well all weekend, practice, even practicing in back in the the hotel room, practicing well there. I was, I was on for nine darters, missing nine darters, and my dad says to me, "This will be your weekend." And then I kept on saying, "I'm no, no, no. Every game, one game at a time, and every person I play this is all. Oh, he's a good player. He's a great player. He could beat me." And he says, no, 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 he says, it's your weekend. So he, he was excited at the end, but he, he was telling me all weekend that I, I, that I could win it. So uh, I, I took a bit of uh, my, uh, my dad's advice, and for once I listened to him, and we came away with a trophy. Well, congrats on that, man. So now listen, the celebration really started after you hit the bullseye. You ran off stage, then you do all the press. Do you go home? No. I'm not sure if you saw my video on uh, the Daryl Gurney all-nighter, but... The fans seem to enjoy the fact that you stuck around, man. You took pictures, you partied a bit, you seemed to have a good time afterwards with them. Yeah, no, I went back to the, done all my interviews, uh, relaxed in the venue just for another 10, 15 minutes. And all in. We went back in there, shall we? I got shower changed and back out and spent a few hours up in the, just in the bar or whatever it was in the venue. And uh, we, we, I must have done about a thousand photographs. So, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the crowd... I uh, had a big uh, part to play in that final as well. They were they were shouting my name, so I thought uh, I would have went out anyway if I, if I got beat. But uh, I still thought I'd go there and give something back because, as I say, I'm just a, a normal dark player. I'm a normal person. I know people look at us as a TV major winner and an old number five. But um, I just I just went up and I thought it'd be nice to stay uh, hang around with the fans and put on a bit of Sweet Caroline and we all jumped around and done a bit of uh, singing and dancing. Oh, that's great, man. Speaking of Sweet Caroline, uh, my perception is this, is that uh, 
with the walk-on song, it must give you a real charge, but also with the nickname, and I got to say that at the beginning, I wasn't so sure about it, but it's really grown on me. It seems to me with the walk-on song, with the nickname, with the, the two majors now, your image has never been better. Yeah, well... For me, I, I, I know he's a hard word, but uh, I still I just like Super Chim, but uh, my manager will not let me change it. <laughs> uh, and there it goes, uh, we've ordered too many shirts, so we have to stick with it. And so that, uh, my, it's my manager's fault for that reason, the NBA promotions, but uh, I have to stick with it now. But as you say, no, the, the walk-on's great. At, uh, obviously, it gets a whole crowd involved, and uh, they all know the words. So it's nice when everything join in because they they whenever they can join in and get their signs shown on TV, their outfits they've spent, and then obviously it shows that they're having a good time. And if they can get involved for uh, three seconds, two minutes, it makes a big difference to them. And uh, without the crowds, there be there be, wouldn't be any darts on TV at all. So uh, you've always got to give something back. Well, it looked like it was a great time. I laughed at the picture of you tucking the trophy in the bed. That was funny, man. Uh, yeah, well, I got on the bed, and that was the manager's idea. So I said, well, if he says he, can, he wants to do it, he can do it. So I, at least I had uh, some company in the bed, so uh, <laughs> I wasn't on my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen, a, a couple more questions. Um, you had that shoulder barge incident with Simon Whitlock at the Grand Prix. Speaking from experience, can I ask your thoughts on what happened at the Grand Slam with Gerwin Price and Gary Anderson. How would you handle an opponent like Gerwin? Because it seemed to really bother Gary. Uh, well, to be honest, I, I mean, Gerwin's done it to me, and uh, I've probably been not as bad as what Gary was, but I, I had a short fuse for him. But uh, the best way to do it is actually just stand back at the table where your waters and your drinks are sitting and just stand back there until he's celebrated until he's probably walked halfway down the hockey and then make your approach stay through. Because I think that, uh, obviously, Gary's a very fast player. And I think if Gary had just taken an extra couple of seconds before Gerwin to get out of the way, I think uh, Gary would have played a bit better and probably would have came around and come away with a trophy. Because we all know, obviously, I'm a, I'm a fan of Gary Anderson, how good he is. And I think that he, uh, I think he, he would have won that tournament if he had just taken an extra couple of steps back instead of getting in behind uh, Gerwin and being too fast. Well, I see Gary, a brilliant player, of course. I see he's one of the favorites for the William Hill World Championship. Michael Van Gerwen is the favorite. You're going to be right up there. You're riding a wave of confidence heading in. I see that you've either got Ross Smith or Paul Lim. I would never cheer against Ross. He's a former guest of ours. But what would a matchup with Paul Lim be like for you in that first round? Uh, well, I definitely think that the crowd would be on Paul's uh Paul say because uh, I mean he's such a legend of the game. Obviously he uh, done the first ever nine darter, and then obviously last year he played Guy Anderson. And he missed a double for the nine darter game, which probably would have been the base and on the cake of his career. First man to do it, and then he done another one thirty years later. So uh, I think that would have been a great, great thing. But um, obviously I, I think it's going to be a tight game between Ross. I mean Ross is first year back in the PDC, qualified for the Worlds, and I know Ross well. We always chat about being a parents and stuff like that so uh, that, that's great but uh, I think with the experience Ross has had this year and how well he's played I think Ross could could win the game but then again Paul's won a uh, play that the uh, Lally Pally that many times that maybe a, a little bit more experience than what he has could end up getting him through so I, I'd safely say it's nearly a perfect perfect game between them two this is the big one right I mean this is the one everyone gets ready for you're on a high you're ready right uh, yeah, I'm already, always ready. I mean, obviously, practice started from us ages ago, and obviously, I've missed doubles and lost out in tournaments where I've, uh, I've missed my opportunities. I've never been on a day this last few months. I've uh, played myself out of a game by missing doubles. So I know that if, if I don't miss, I've always got the opportunity and always, I can always beat anybody. So uh, it's just a matter of whatever I've got now, the results from last week and the confidence I've got and show that, that I can have everything that I go for in a big match under the biggest amount of pressure. I just have to keep on, keep the arm going now, keep the rust off because I'm getting old now, and uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, play as well as I did over the Players' Championship and not miss doubles, and obviously they're taking out the big finishes. Well, I'll tell you what, if you play like that, if you play like you did at the Players' Championship at the World Championship, you're in with the show, man. You were superb. Congratulations on that. Real quick, uh, you you tweeted a picture of you holding the trophy, and in the in the text is your wife's name. Now, 
I don't know how to pronounce that. Is that an Irish name? Yes, it's an Irish name. It's pronounced Anya. Okay, Anya. Okay, nice name. Yeah. And and the future of darts, Daryl Junior. Uh, I mean, is he going to be as good as you or what? Uh, well, if I if I could help him, he'd be better than me. But uh, if if there was some other sport that he, he took an interest in rather than darts, like a snooker or golf or football, I would definitely encourage him to take up. Uh, them because it's a, a lot healthier sport. <laughs> has he changed your game any? Like, has he made it better? Um, no, to be honest. I mean, obviously, there's. I used to practice late at night before I went to bed, probably 10 or 11 o'clock. And then now he uh, has caught sets below the dartboard, so the dartboard hasn't been used in actual months. So I have to travel to my uh, mother and father's house to do a bit of practicing, but it's only, it's only five minutes away. But um, no, I, I stay with him until he goes to sleep, and then I go for a practice, so I don't miss seeing his, uh, seeing his wee face. Well, man, listen, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, congratulations. Superb win. That was brilliant. Edge of your seat stuff. Good times for the Gurney clan right now. Daryl Gurney, two-time major winner, riding high into the alley, pal. We, we wish you luck, man, sincerely. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. No problem. appreciate the phone call. Thank you very much.